Ring around the rosy, a pocket full of posies. Ashes, ashes, we all fall down. <laughs> Welcome to the Parasite Podcast. I'm Sherry. And I'm Marie. And today we're going to do part two of episode 33, The Wolf You Feed. In the last episode, we discussed the beginning of the marriage that created Jesse and their childhood, as well as the problems that Jesse continued to have as he tried to become an adult. So now he is 25 years old. Right. If you want the details of Jesse's life or Hadassah's life or even Sherman's life, go back and listen to part one. We'll wait right here for you. On September 25th, 2007, 22-year-old Amy was enjoying a taste of freedom. She had to get her school kids loaded on a bus for an after-school field trip, but then she'd have a few hours of nothing until they returned. She liked these small windows of nothingness that she was starting to enjoy now that she'd finished up her bachelor's degree in psychology. Her mom called and asked her when she was coming home. Amy knew she could make it home if she needed to, but she didn't really want to go. She'd made plans. She asked her mom if she was okay, and Hadass said she was fine and not to worry about it. And then she hung up. Jesse called her shortly thereafter. He seemed to be tense and unhappy. He was also asking Amy when she would be home. Amy told him she had plans and that she had work obligations that would keep her out until around 10 p.m., they talked for a few minutes and planned to watch Quantum Leap together later that evening. Amy figured Jessie and her mom were fighting, which was obviously not a rare occasion at home. She was kind of glad she had plans for the evening. Amy headed to the tattoo parlor to acquire a new tat, a tiny peace sign on her inner wrist, before she headed off to a blind date. I guess you call it a blind date when you meet someone online dating and then decide to meet them in real life. I'm not sure, but it seems like a blind date, right? I guess. That's what we'll call it, because that's kind of what she was doing. She thought this guy seemed really nice and kind of fun, so she agreed to meet up for dinner. And he was not kind of fun. She had a fairly shitty time. You. <laughs> <laughs> All he wanted to talk about was his incel life and his IBS. Oof, not first date conversation. Mm, neither of them. He was a basement boy who spent his days playing video games and sitting on the toilet. This was not the man for her. Her phone rang and Amy noticed it was her mom again. This date was going nowhere. So Amy excused herself and stepped away to talk to her mom. Again, her mother asked her when she would be returning home. Amy reiterated she would be returning home after 10 p.m. and again asked if everything was okay. Her mom said, fine, and hung up. So Amy continued her bad date. But the phone rang again. She picked up because it was Jessie and because it was such an awful date. And she reminded Jessie that she was on this date. He gruffly requested she let him know when she was on her way home. And then he hung up on her. And that was when Amy was pretty sure something was wrong at home. But things were wrong at home all the time. Jessie was just getting meaner and meaner. This was simply SSDS. And she was tired. Her mom was the one who kept letting Jessie come back home. She couldn't always be there. She needed to be able to have a life, too. Amy figured she'd be home soon enough. She'd hurry her students along when they returned from their field trip so she could get home and see what was going on. (music) 
Because 25-year-old Jesse was the only one at home who lived through the night, he has controlled the narrative of what happened in the house. Jesse claims he made himself a sandwich and had just settled in to eat it when his mother waltzed into the kitchen and insisted he clean his mess up right now. Sometimes people set him off, and sometimes he was just in a sour mood and went off on his mom because she was handy. He didn't say which was happening, but tonight had been a bad night for Hadass. He'd stabbed her to death with the butcher knife he'd used to make his sandwich. No one thinks it's unusual he was using a butcher knife to make a sandwich? Exactly that, but like I said, he has control of the narrative. Anyway, remembering her promise to Jesse, Amy gave him a call on her way home from ensuring her young charges had safely returned from that field trip. Jesse was weird and seemed noncommittal about the plans that they had made to watch Quantum Leap, so she wasn't sure what was going on. He told her he wasn't really home anymore. She thought that was weird, but okay. She dialed her mom. No answer. She tried again. No answer. And that is when Amy panicked. Her mom always picked up. She called Jessie back. She said, Jessie, mom's not answering her phone. What's up with that? After a pause, he said, don't come home. She felt that comment deep in the pit of her stomach. Cautiously, she asked, What do you mean? What do you mean don't go home? And he said, Just don't come home. And he hung up on her. It's horrible. Mm, Yeah. She was panicked. She dialed her mom again. No answer again. She dialed Jesse's number again and again as she flew down Mulholland Highway trying to get home to make sure her mom was okay. Jesse eventually picked up. Mom's not answering. Where is she? After a small pause, Jesse said, I killed Mom. Don't go home. And Amy did what every good daughter would do. She called 911 as she drove. Dispatch was talking to her as she pulled into the drive. She told them everything and then said, and this is a quote, I'm hoping to God he was lying and I'm sorry if I'm... If he, if he was, he might have lied. I don't know. Amy explained that Jesse often said things just like this to see how upset he could get her. The dispatcher advised her to remain in her car and wait for the emergency responders. They said, don't go inside the house. The killer may still be there. Amy scoffed. She'd been living with this killer her entire life and nobody had ever cared. Not one bit. She shut off her car and ran into the house. And what she found changed her life forever. Amy found her mother in the kitchen. It was too late to do anything for her. Jesse had taken a shower, leaving his bloodied clothes in a heap on the bathroom floor as his mother lay dying. Disregarding her, he had jumped into his mother's car and pieced on out of there before Amy returned home to discover the mess he'd made of her life. It's so sad. I know. The police arrived, and the hunt was soon on. They discovered he'd ditched his mom's car sometime around midnight and caught a ride with a friend in a Range Rover. He told the friend he was in a bit of trouble and needed to get himself to Mexico. It's not clear if he thought this was a James Bond movie or if he'd simply run out of gas and didn't have Mom around to fill his gas tank. But the police had him on their radar and they pulled that Range Rover over on Ventura Boulevard near DeSoto Avenue. They found Jesse hiding in the back seat. It took half an hour to coax him out, but he eventually came out without a fight and was arrested. The media announced Jesse had been captured and that he did not have a record of arrests for violence. What? I know. That makes me so furious. The police had been to that house for welfare calls more than 20 times. Jesse had been taken away and held until he could collect himself, sometimes for hours, sometimes for days. And he had a criminal record for assault the one where he was allowed to plead no contest after going after his mother threatening to light her on fire. 
Yeah, he'd been violent against her for a very long time. Yes, maybe not against everyone else in the neighborhood, but his family, yes. Yeah, this did not come out of the blue. Right. That just makes me so mad. Yeah. Anyway, what happened after that? So, after his arrest, Jesse got to live his life in jail in relative comfort as he awaited trial. But Amy was left to fend for herself. Mm. Her mother's careful planning had been a bit misguided. She died intestate, so her entire estate, including that accidental life insurance policy, went into probate. Oh, no. Yeah. So Amy would not see any money until her brother was brought to justice due to the Slayer laws. But I guess that'll be okay, right? I mean, she can be patient and wait for her money, because in the end, she is going to get it, right? Well, you're correct that, in the end, Amy will be the only one inheriting. But think about it. Amy is in her early 20s. She's just starting out in life, and she'd been living at home. So now, instead of living at home where her mom pays the bills, she's responsible for a mortgage, utilities, transportation, and she needs to find a way to give her mom a proper burial. Wow. Yeah. She's working as a substitute teacher, which means she can arrange her own schedule, which she now needs to do in order to show up at all of her brother's court hearings over the, what will end up being, years. Substitute teachers are paid by the day, so every day that she has to miss, she doesn't get paid. That's horrible. I hadn't really thought about that. Her expenses have now, like, quadrupled, and she's struggling to stay afloat while her brother's hanging out in relative comfort without a care in the world. You know, that seems to be a common problem in domestic violence situations. Yeah, it's always the way it seems to go. The abuser is rarely the person who suffers the financial consequences of his abuse. So sad and frustrating. Mm-hmm. So, a little short of two years after the murder, Jesse was finally deemed competent to stand trial. It's at this point that he will have to appear in court and make a plea. Amy, feeling unable to move forward from this chaos without some resolution, and her inheritance so that she can afford to finish up her mom's affairs and move on with her own life, went to visit Jesse in jail. This is what she had been doing for her entire life, visiting her mother's abuser in the mental ward or in jail after a violent episode. But this time, she was going alone. That's so sad. Yeah. As usual, Jesse made a sort of apology that distanced himself from his bad behavior. He told her that he was so sorry, but he was so high at the time he didn't know what he was doing. That was his defense that he was trying for. Not guilty due to diminished capacity. So again, not my fault. Yeah, it's never his fault. And he just keeps getting worse. So Amy gathered up her courage and proclaimed that she simply did not believe him. Jesse next had the audacity to proclaim that his mother's spirit was visiting him often, and she had already forgiven him. Isn't it funny how many of these murderers say, oh, they've already come back down and told me I'm fine, I'm good. Yeah, it's very easy to be forgiven, but I don't understand why the spirit would visit him and not her daughter. Exactly. Amy informed Jesse that she had not forgiven him and was pretty sure she never would forgive him for what he'd done to their mother. Good. Yeah. She begged him to just suck it up and take responsibility for what he'd done this next hearing so she wouldn't have to keep paying for his choices with distress and instability. I really feel for her. Yeah. He didn't, though. He just gave her this ironic smile and said he'd think about it, again reiterating how he wasn't really responsible because he'd been so high he didn't know what he was doing and couldn't really even remember it happening. Yeah, he's very uh, selfish. And basic. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. And the alternative, Amy asked him to sign over her half of the inheritance, basically relinquishing his rights to her half of his mother's estate. Mm. So he agreed to do that, and he did make good with his promise at his next court hearing. But he never does take any responsibility for murdering their mother. So, question. Okay. Is not guilty due to diminished capacity the same as guilty by reason of insanity? No, it's not quite the same. We talked about the insanity defense at length in an earlier episode. 
that's where you're able to convince a judge or a jury that you didn't actually realize what you'd done was wrong at the time that you committed a murder. Mm -hmm. So if you're found not guilty by reason of insanity, you get sent to a mental hospital, often for the rest of your life. Okay. Yeah, so that's, um, you know, the criminally insane person. That's Mm -hmm. someone who has to be in a mental hospital because they aren't successfully being treated. But once they're cured, they get out. Yeah, that's the idea, but um, a lot of these people just don't get better, so they end up in the mental hospital for the rest of their life. Yeah. Now, Jesse was going for the diminished capacity defense, and he's saying that he was so high at the time that he was incapable of reaching the mental state, the mens rea, Mm -hmm. the intention or knowledge of wrongdoing that constitutes part of a crime, required to convict him of murder. Interesting. Yeah. So if this defense works, then what happens is the defendant can be convicted of manslaughter, but not murder. So you can literally say, I was so high, I didn't realize I committed that murder. And that's a legitimate defense? In some states, yes, but not really. Mm -hmm. But many states have moved away from allowing that defense at all. For instance, it's since been abolished in California. After a case used what came to be called diminished capacity, the Twinkie defense. Mm -hmm. In short, the defense was that eating too much junk food leaves you stupid, so the attorney claiming this argued there was no way he could have formed mens rea at the time of the murder. Oh, wow. Yeah. We'll leave the details about that Twinkie defense on our Patreon page in case you're interested in learning more, but it's pretty silly. Yeah. It seems foolish to allow someone to get a lighter sentence because they'd committed prior bad acts, like using drugs. So would you say on a gradient scale that diminished capacity is a less powerful defense than the insanity defense? For sure. Like I said, in most cases, diminished capacity isn't really a defense so much as a mitigating factor. Mm. So it limits the defendant's criminal liability in a case, turning a felony into a misdemeanor or shortening a sentence. So it mitigates the crime. But an insanity defense is a complete affirmative defense that essentially makes the charge, in essence, go away. Oh, okay. So it's kind of like the difference between a divorce and annulment, right? Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. So do all states allow the insanity defense? Nope. Kansas, Montana, Idaho, and Utah do not allow the insanity defense at all. Wow. Yeah. So in this case, they eventually held a hearing regarding Jesse's desire to use diminished capacity. He was saying he was so high that he had absolutely no memory of what had happened until he was found hunkered down in the back of a stranger's, not his friend's, car with police surrounding him. He's a piece of cake. (laughs) He is a piece of something. But the DA's office had done their job, and Jesse's claims that the drugs had compelled him to kill his mother and that he'd been temporarily unable to discern right from wrong was destroyed by three of his own little words. Don't go home. (laughs) That's true. By advising his sister to stay away from the house, he indicated that he knew exactly what he had done and that it was very wrong. So his ability to plea under a theory of diminished capacity was overruled, and Jesse was back to square one with his defense. (laughs) But I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Jesse, still in jail and trying to find a way out of this pickle, simply continued his past abuse strategies. But this time, instead of screaming at and castigating his family, doctors, teachers, and therapists, he was extremely violent and threatening toward his lawyers. Hmm. The same lawyers the state had paid to defend him. And the doctors and therapists, appointed therapists and doctors, and even the lawyers, dropped out one by one, leaving Jesse without a defense lawyer. So they weren't able to try him or really even deal with him. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. And he also realized that he could go off of his meds and refuse to take them, and court would be canceled every time. So he did just that. In March of 2010, Jesse was once again found mentally incompetent to stand trial. It took that long? Yeah, it took a really long time. When someone is found incompetent, they're sent to a mental hospital or a special unit in the jail for treatment, which, remember, is where Jesse was, Mm -hmm. and then a report is made to the judge after a specified period of time. In this case, Jesse was being treated at the Patton State Hospital. So it usually takes about six months, but this one took three years? Or I'm I'm not sure, like, how did the judge decide three years? Or Well, so it's about every six months in most states that they're reassessed. Oh, okay. And then it just keeps going on forever till they're assessed as competent? Yeah. Okay, got it. So the treatment facility spends six months trying to restore competency. So since... This was 2010. Jesse had probably been through the competency process five or six times already. 
So is Jesse considered not guilty due to mental illness at this point? No, competency is completely separate from guilt. If they're found incompetent, it means they are not capable or with it enough mentally mm -hmm. to aid the attorney in their defense. And they aren't capable of making decisions regarding that defense. So once competency is restored, the trial is back on. Ah, uh, okay, got it. Yeah, so it was approximately three and a half years after the murder, and a year after Amy had visited him in jail, when Jesse, unable to plead diminished capacity, figured out a new way to weasel out of his troubles. He wrote a letter to a fellow inmate saying, Check it out. A couple years ago, my sister initially came up with the idea to do this thing. No. Yeah, and he went on to say that Amy had actually initiated the plan to murder their mother and wanted him to help. No way. Yeah, and he told the fellow inmate, quote, I said she was crazy and that I would get the electric chair, but she kept making little comments about it every few weeks and bringing up good points about it. <laughs> yeah. She said when I got out, I could live with her and she would split all the money she gets with me and nobody would ever know. But it's been a while now, unquote. Wow. Yeah, he, um, in my opinion, he did this knowing that it would be intercepted, but... Right. I think so, too. Yeah. In the end, Jesse had asked this inmate to kill Amy when he got out, thinking that this would make everything go away. So now he was set. Amy would die, and no one would care about him being convicted of murder anymore, or, at the least, he could drag Amy down with him, and possibly create enough doubt about him being the murderer that he could get out of these charges, or at least a reduced sentence. He did that to his own sister. Did he really think that was going to work? I said that Jesse was mean and manipulative, not smart and educated. <laughs> True. And obviously would not have helped his situation. But the potential hitman, still a prisoner, turned him in, so that didn't work. Mm -hmm. And of course, the investigators now had to go and put Amy through the humiliation of asking her if she'd been a part of the murder, which destroyed her emotionally. Mm. After waiting for almost four years for just a little bit of actual justice in her mother's death, it felt like she was being pushed back to square one. But everyone knew Amy was not part of the plan. It was a formality that the investigators had to put Amy through because of this accusation. That's terrible. It is. And it's so sad that they had to do that. But, I mean, I think he just did his best to make sure that everyone was miserable around him. I know. They just need to go ahead and get him convicted. Mm -hmm. But the justice system was on the struggle bus with him. He really needed to be out of jail and in prison if he was found to be guilty. Mm -hmm. And every criminal has a constitutional right to representation at trial. But the Constitution did not anticipate people like Jesse, who use manipulation to ensure representation is impossible. Oh my gosh, I hadn't even thought of that. Yeah, um, he continued to berate and threaten attorneys until they quit claiming that he wanted to represent himself, but then asking for an attorney after messing around for several months, strategically refusing his medications and getting into altercations with other inmates. And lawyer after lawyer walked away from defending him. After four long years, everyone but Jesse was exhausted and the case was not progressing. He could do this forever. He really could. He wasn't doing anything else. Mm -hmm. It was at this point that the prosecution approached Amy about offering him a plea deal. She was emotionally exhausted, and the prosecutor advised her that a guy like Jesse would get a 15-year-to-life sentence, but that guys like him didn't really ever get out of prison. He doubted that Jesse would ever be getting out of prison if they could just get him there in the first place. And, you know, he's saying that because we all know that good behavior is how you get out early, right? Right. And Jesse's incapable of that. Right. But I'm also seeing a lot of really bad foreshadowing here on Amy's behalf. Yeah, because it's going to be a fight to keep him in forever. Mm -hmm. But Amy hated this idea, but agreed to go along with it. But Jesse hated it, too. So more time passed, and Jesse remained in jail, thinking he could find a way to get out of this trouble. So Amy is out on the outside, struggling to survive, and Jesse is fed and clothed, maybe not as comfortably as he'd like, maybe more comfortably than he supposed, I don't know. Mm hmm while he schemes. Yeah, he's just in there playing games with everyone else's lives. So, a few months later, Jesse requested a court date for a settlement conference, and it was scheduled for September 2011, a few days after the fourth anniversary of the murder of his mother. That's a long time. Mm-hmm. And poor Amy, she had spent the last few years missing work to attend hearings, 
unable to truly grieve her loss, preparing to give testimony at trial, reliving her experience, and worrying about her safety. She needed to find a way to move forward and hoped they could find a resolution in this. She was hopeful about the settlement conference because it could possibly give her that option. At that settlement conference, Jesse was offered a plea deal he was willing to accept. See, he knew the score. He'd spent the past decade pleading no contest to keep himself from having to take responsibility for any of his violent behaviors. And that wasn't about to change. He pled no contest to second-degree murder and was sentenced to 15 years to life. That seems so wrong. I know, and it's... (sighs) It's complicated. I can see that. But it just seems so wrong. Yeah, it's very hard because Amy didn't get the closure of him just pleading guilty and taking responsibility. Right. But she did get him to go to prison and stop with all of these new court dates that keep getting canceled. That's true. So that it re- gives her some peace, right? Yeah, it reduced his ability to disrupt her life willy-nilly. So he was immediately sentenced to 15 years to life, and Amy, disappointed at this anticlimactic ending, still breathed a sigh of relief, picked up the remaining pieces of her life, and was finally able to begin moving forward. So that took four years before she got any justice at all. Mm Mm-hmm. It's just so long, and her relief would be so short-lived. A little over 13 years later, on April 16th, 2021, Amy received her first parole notice. Mm -hmm. Jesse would have his first parole hearing on August 3rd, 2021, in the midst of the COVID pandemic. Ah. Yeah, so she's already going through a global pandemic and has to deal with her brother who has threatened her life, her whole life, maybe getting out. So Amy said, quote, that hearing, it was so traumatic. It was, it was reliving everything all over again, unquote. Pretty common, right? Yeah, they're horrible for the survivors. And she had a lot of stress even before the hearing due to clerical errors that almost precluded her attendance. They cleared her for the wrong parolee. (laughs) Yeah, and I know everything was, you know, we all remember 2021 was a mess all Mm -hmm. around, but it was very stressful. And then once that was cleared up, she had to go listen to her brother at the hearing. He told the parole board he was a bad man when he arrived in prison and it had only gotten worse. Oh, this is helping his case. Yeah, he claimed to have stabbed 90 fellow prisoners since his incarceration. (laughs) And then he turned to Amy reciting her current address and bragging that he could easily kill her and her whole family. OMG, that would do me in. Yeah, that would be awful. I don't know how she's withstanding this. But it was clear that things weren't going well for Jesse, right? Yeah, well, he sat there and continued to threaten her life. And then, at some point, Jesse realized that this parole board, they could decide to sentence him to remain in prison for the next 15 years. And that that was probably imminent. So he asked the parole board about a loophole he'd heard about. Could he, due to COVID, delay his hearing for some time? But wait, he he can't stop the hearing right in the middle of it. If he's going to be exposed to COVID, that likely already occurred because everyone's there. Exactly. But this COVID rule allowed Jesse that option, even after the hearing had commenced. And he told them he'd see them in two years. Oh my gosh. Yeah. But they told him, hold on a second, his sister was prepared to make a statement. He asked, am I legally obligated to listen? And they said no. So he said, okay, bye, and he walked out. So almost 14 years after murdering his mother, he's still refusing to accept responsibility, and he's still playing the legal system? Yep. Wow. Yeah. So she was there and and gave her speech and continues to pay for his crimes. She has to continue to suffer through the distress of preparing for and the costs, you know, lost work, child care expenses, probably Mm -hmm. a great deal of therapy to travel again to a parole hearing in just two years instead of the typical 15 year respite. Mm -hmm. And it should be mentioned, she'll be tasked with the upsetting job of attending parole hearings for the rest of her life or Jesse's. People don't really think about that very often. It's horrible. Um, And it's a huge toll on someone to have to keep doing this over and over. And have that band-aid ripped off every single time. Yeah. So, Amy, in the podcast, The Stranger You Know, nails it when discussing what happens when a guy like Jesse is your child. Hadass and Amy were both trapped in a hell-called family. 
there was eventually no help for Jesse, and they were told to take him home and try to survive him. And sadly, that's all too common. Jail can't hold a domestic abuser unless the victims support the charges. This is changing, thank goodness, in some states. Lawmakers and policymakers are starting to understand that the victim is just that, a victim. Someday, they will be a survivor, but they are not in the moment that their abuser is arrested. Mm -hmm. The abuser is still someone who is mostly loved and cared for, as well as feared. Insisting that the victim must hold fast to the charges puts them in an untenable position. How do you do that to your beloved child, spouse, or other domestic abuser? Laws are starting to change so that this decision is taken completely out of the victim's control. As it is for most crimes, right? Mm -hmm. If someone robs you, you don't just withdraw charges. Right. But someone as abusive as even Jesse... They're rarely sentenced to more than a year or two. That's true. Especially because it's domestic abuse. So jail and prison become a revolving door. Mental health facilities are also revolving doors. Keeping abusive people who have clear mental issues away for hours, days, and weeks, and then releasing them back to their family, angrier than ever. Mm. And families, they take the abuser back to keep them from falling into homelessness because there is often nowhere for these ragers to stay. No one else would tolerate their behavior. Mm. And maybe the neighbor lady who spoke to the Los Angeles Daily News put it best. She said, quote, all I can say is she loved him so much. She loved him too much, I guess. What a sad story. What happened to everyone? After Hadassah's death, Sherman appeared to somewhat step up for the family he'd neglected all those years. Sure, he'd kept in touch enough that the kids knew who he was. They had spent some weekends with him during the brief moments when he tried to stay sober. And they knew he had a very serious drinking problem. But he'd never really been available as a parent to his children. First, he invited his grieving daughter on an all-expense-paid trip to the local casinos, um, mm. which was a weird choice already, but mm -hmm. it went so badly that she went home early. Oh. And at that point, he decided that perhaps he should actually try. He sobered up a bit and started calling both Amy and Jesse, trying to impart some wisdom, letting them know he somewhat felt the obligation of their existence now that their mother was gone. Wow. Yeah. If he loved them... At the least, his daughter didn't know it, and his sobriety lasted a very short while. But he had a lot of obligations, because he'd had a child with his longtime girlfriend, and she wanted their child to have a father. He was soon back to being best friends with the bottle and neglecting his adult children. That's really sad. It seems like the older children often kind of get the short end of the stick. Mm -hmm. And it's just sad to see that happening here. It is. So, he died on March 10th, 2018, lucky enough to avoid both COVID and Jesse's first parole hearing. Mm. Source records indicate he was a beloved professor at the South Coast College. They started a GoFundMe to help defray his burial costs, and he seems to have learned as he grew older. He appeared to be a present father for his youngest son, always supporting him and very close to him. He continued to love music and was registered with the American Federation of Musicians, as a clarinet player, they listed his surviving family as a wife and a son, completely ignoring the existence of his first two children. Wow. Yeah. Um, what about Amy? Amy seems to be doing very well for herself. She recently released her novel, Working for Justice, One Family's Tale of Murder. We read that for this episode, mm -hmm. and it was a very excellent book. It was. It chronicles the struggles and challenges she went through as she tried to survive this travesty. And in reading it, you can see that it is so much to process, and it's still hard for her. Right. After the murder, Amy caught a lot of flack from friends and strangers alike. She said in an interview, a lot of times people are like, Why did you, how could you ignore the red flags? <laughs> well, we didn't really. We tried to get help from so many different avenues. And this is very upsetting to me because as far as we could see, no one ever held Jesse's father to the same standard. 
no one confronted him or blamed him for not showing up, for not protecting his first wife or his daughter from the son he created. Yeah. Or helping his son learn to be a good man. That's really true. And he never gave them any break. No, he never helped in any way. And there's no way he wasn't aware that his son was going through all of this, that his son had attempted suicide at 15. Right. So as angry as I am about the way that Sherman is treated in this, I'm happy to say that Amy and her children are working on their happily ever after. And we wish them all the best. Yes, indeed. So as far as Jesse goes, in June of 2022, he requested to be transferred to the Pleasant Valley Prison in Fresno, California. He had asked for this transfer so he could be closer to family members who support his being released from prison as soon as possible. I wonder who they are. I'm not sure, but I do not think they're making good choices. But this request was granted. And that's where everyone is today. Wow. Well, we'd like to thank Bonnie's blog of crime, the Los Angeles Daily News, CBS News, the Daily Breeze, the Daily News, the Pasadena Star News, Facebook, the Cinemaholic, the book Working for Justice, One Family's Tale of Murder, Betrayal, and Healing by Amy Chesler that we talked about. The podcast, The Stranger You Know, Discovery ID's Evil Lives Here series, Episode 2, What If He Gets Out, and Murderpedia. And of course, we'd like to thank Jade Brown for the music. And most of all, we'd like to thank you, our listeners. We so appreciate your comments and your questions and your recommendations for cases you'd like to hear about. You're amazing. Thank you. This has been the Parasite Podcast. And remember... Always sleep with one eye open. Ashes, ashes, we all fall down.